Welcome to the Yale Centre for British Arts online series, At Home, Artists in Conversation. I'm Christine Chikinska, the Senior Curator of African and Diaspora Textiles and Fashion at the v &A Museum here in London. And I'm delighted to welcome Highland Booker to our programme today. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Please note that this programme will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the programme. We'll be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather up your questions for Highland and they will be answered at the end of the programme. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the programme as we go along. Yale University acknowledges that Indigenous people and nations, including Mohican, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shagticoke, Golden Hill Poor Gazette, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking people have stewarded through generations the land and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honour and respect the relationship between them that exists between these people and the nations and this land. Born in Detroit in 1938, Hiram Booker went to Cass Technical High School in Detroit, where he studied commercial art. He soon became interested in designing fashion for women. A year later, he joined the US Air Force and was stationed to England for three years. He went on to study fashion at the Royal College of Art in London and soon went into business himself, starting Highland Booker Limited, designing coats and suits for women. In 1967, he won the Yardley Award for the best designer of the year, the best British designer of the year. In 1968, Booker went to the House of Worth, the French fashion house founded in 1858 by English designer Charles Frederick Worth that specialised in haute couture, ready-to-wear clothes and perfume. So Frederick Worth, for many, is the father of haute couture. Booker moved back to the United States in 1980 and launched Highland Booker Couture in Miami with his wife. He also created Maya Cosmetics, a range of makeup and skincare products for darker skins, in partnership with cosmetic marketing consultant Barbara Attenborough. So welcome Highland to the programme. It's wonderful to be speaking with you again. It's been fabulous getting to know you actually over this past almost a year. Oh, it's great. Thanks very much. I'm very glad to be here. And I really want to um, begin by sharing with our audience something of the way that Highland and I met. So when I joined the v &A in 2020, shortly after joining, I was interviewed by the New York Times for the article, The Incredible Whiteness of the Museum Fashion Collection. And after it was published, I finally went into work and I had a mysterious brown package. And it was the first piece of mail that I received in this new role, in fact. And this seemingly innocent little package was actually from you, Highland, telling me that you were an African-American former GI and former head of design at the House of Work. And yeah. actually, I'm going to read a little bit of that uh, letter. I have it here and it, it really sparked my interest. I thought I've got to find a way of getting in touch with this man. So it reads, Dear Christine Chikinska, I'm constantly amazed by the fashion narrative in which it seems my presence as the head designer of the House of Worth in London in 1969 was heralded and then somehow left out of a very white history. Do we write history we want or the history that was? I certainly didn't usher in some sort of great fashion movement, but it was a fact. Being a black designer who studied at the Royal College of Art, I'd made an impression at that moment and that it should be totally ignored and somehow forgotten makes a mockery of history and a mockery of fashion. It was an interesting time and I had great coverage in fashion magazines and newspapers and in Women's Wear Daily. And the collections themselves were really well received, though not earth shattering. I would argue they were earth shattering. In spite of the theatricality of the moment, I was deeply committed to elegance and cultural influences. It'd be nice if this record was included a 
and reflected in the times and a moment of greater social change, 1969. So yeah. there you have it, Highland. So would you like to maybe speak a little bit to that letter and this idea of the gaps in history and how race and culture influences the way that histories are written, particularly fashion history? I was just amazed by the uh, whole idea. I was looking at the Smithsonian's uh, book on the history of fashion, which is a wonderful book, full of incredible details and information and everything. And so when I got to the worth, that was understandable. It was about him. It was an am amazing moment in the history of fashion. And then we, we went on to the 60s, and I saw friends of mine who were mentioned, you know, that were important at the time, Ozzy Clark, uh, Sally Ann Tuffin, and uh, there was just tons of other people mentioned, and I wasn't there. And I kept thinking, that's an odd thing to do. And it wasn't like I was, you know, I wasn't there. I was <laughs> right there with the rest of them. And also received some of the same kind of information and the kind of accolades of being the first of something. And it was a lot of fun. The 60s was an incredible time to be working. Not that when you're in the 60s, you knew that it was the 60s. It was just life as you were receiving it and how you were dealing with it. But I did find it strange that when reading this great tomb of a fashion history that uh, I had disappeared, <laughs> which was odd, since I had all these records and I have all these photos of all that had taken place at the time. When we spoke about this um, previously, you said to me that you were a harbinger of the future. We were talking about um, designers like Virgil Abloh, for example, sadly passed away now, but at the helm of Louis Vuitton. And you were saying that in a way you were the future, you know, yeah. a black designer at the head of a, uh, an international fashion brand. Yes, I think that, that that's the strangest feeling when, you, when you're in the present and something from the future happens and it doesn't fit, doesn't quite fit the narrative that we're constructing at the time. At the time, of course, the people were very enthusiastic and very fond, and not all, of course, but I did pretty well. Uh, I didn't think about it in the terms of history, incidentally. It was just work, you know, good work. If you get to do what you want to do in life, meaning this case in designing clothes, then that was the greatest thing of all. So it was all gravy for me. So I'm hoping that what we can do today then is to somehow speak into this gap in history and let it be known that you were amongst the first, if not the first African-American to work as a high profile couturier on this side of the Atlantic. Um, and so I want to, through this conversation, think about the elements that continue to draw you, even today in, in your life as a painter. So this, this conversation with women, this conversation with elegance, this conversation with grace that's played out through your design career and now through your life as a painter, through your entire artistic life, there's this wonderful engagement with women, glamour, elegance. So yeah. let's go right back to the beginning. I love these photographs. So let's go right back to the beginning, the early years and the women that influenced you. You mentioned your mother, for example, being an influence on your understanding and appreciation of fashion. Yes, I, I could basically brought up by women, you know, which is really a great treat, especially if that's what you enjoy. And they, you know, once you start as a young man with, with they, they, is this right, darling? They would ask you, is this good? What do you think of this? Well, you, so you suddenly have to have an opinion and your opinion is sharpened by noticing other things, magazines and other things that you get involved with. And uh, so you, you get an intimacy with hats and dresses and coats, with your, what fabric it is. And I think unbeknownst to me that it was happening, I enjoyed it and uh, it seemed a perfectly natural thing to do, which is what was so wonderful about it. I remember you saying, um, I think I read in um, a New York Times article that your mother was the secret to your success, the Sunday best dress and so on. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think there's nothing great by being brought up by women who like clothes. <laughs> so you catch that bug yourself, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. And so I love the image on the left of the screen as we look at that. So is that your mother? Is that your grandmother? It's in that? My, my grandmother and my stepmother who had taken us to Oklahoma, my brother and I, from Detroit. And we were there for 
a couple of years, which is was a frightening experience because we thought we would be leaving just for, we thought we were just there for the summer. But in fact, uh, we stayed there quite a while. And it was the, one of the reasons why I choose this photograph is that you can come from many different ways to get to the top of whatever you want to do. So I thought that this was a great contrast. Mm -hmm. And so you found yourself at Cass Technical School. Tell us a bit about Cass Technical School, what that was like and how you moved really from commercial art to fashion. It was a wonderful school because everybody there, to go to Cass, you had to qualify and you had to have desire. This was not like a regular high school. You just got stuck in. This is something everybody had a reason to be there and everybody was really intentional and and enthusiastic. So studying and relationship between that and the work was just wonderful. And we had a wonderful art history teacher who just made the history of art come alive in a way that you just, you still have it in your memory to this day. That's how important it was. And it was very mm. important. So there at art school and you're immersed in creativity, but then you joined the US Air Force? Well, I, I actually, I was a year, about nine months off, I actually was a window dresser. I got a job as a window dresser, which was also, well, this reinforced it all the time. In the meantime, I had, in high school, I had won a fashion contest. And I thought, oh, well, I must be able to do this. I thought it was a natural experience. I mean, I thought it was just coming out of me. So therefore, I thought, yeah, this is it. This is what I want to do. And once I decided that it was all I ever thought about. Uh, I never forget walking down Woodward Avenue. This is a, and I was uh, still having, I'm still just a citizen of the world. And I read about Yves Saint Laurent at 21 being the head of the House of Dior. And I thought, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. That's what I want to do. I said that, I made that promise. And, uh, and then of course, like all promises, that's a forgotten thing, you move on. And I was determined to be a dress designer. So. I studied everything I could get my hands on to. And, and of course, uh, I joined the service and was luckily stationed in England, Fairfoot, England, which is a small base in the Gloucestershire of, of England. And it had a most wonderful church there, the oldest church, 1100 years old church. And it was just beautiful. So it was the right kind of place to romanticize one sort of beginning, if you know what I mean? And so it's, it's interesting that you were stationed in Fairford because I grew up really near Fairford. So I know that Swindon and Fairford are a million miles away from London and the swinging sixes fashion scene geographically and psychologically. So tell us how you then moved to London and what drew you to London? Well, uh, the real story is that as the being in the Air Force, uh, I lived uh, a life of three days on, three days off kind of day, night, and three different shifts. So there was a lot of time off that held together. So I would go to London. And, um, and when I went to London, I would, um, I went down Kingley Road, uh, Kings Road. Kings Road. And I saw this shop. It was, this is a, this is a London, I think nobody can imagine it. The shops, everything looked like middle England. It was very quiet. It was not, but this shop called Mary Quant had this amazing mannequin in the window. She was a black and white thing it was. And I could not believe it. It was so magical. And remember now, this is the street is totally dark. It's just this one shop and this fabulous window. And I thought, oh my God, I got it. So I would then make little trips back there when I got back each time I was able to come. And I eventually hung around long enough for the people inside to ask me to come in that I met. Mary Quant and Alexander Plunk and Green at the time. And, and it was a very, very fine time. And they even did uh, photographs uh, with their models on, on the roof of the building. So it was, uh, you know, it was one of those great moments that uh, one never forgets. And, and I was sure that I knew then that it was definitely what I was to be doing. Even though at the time I was going to Swindon for the uh, college, technical college there, studying fashion part of it. And so it was when you were at Swindon that you said to your tutors, I really want to do fashion. Where is the best place to study fashion? And then, of course, they told you it was the Royal College of Art. So you applied to the Royal College of Art. Exactly. And I, and, uh, 
to my amazement, I got in, but I had a deferment because I was still in the service. So I had to come the following year. And, uh, and that's what I did. So I think you mentioned that um, Mary Quant gave you a reference when you were applying. So yeah. you came with great recommendation. Yeah, I did. And of course, I was hoping, you know, one of the great treats is the, how invisible the world is. But as you go through it, you find that there are people who can help you or people who like you and find it interesting and, and your ambitions interesting. So I was very lucky to have Mary and Alexander to reinforce my, in my application. And I think my general enthusiasm also was fairly clear. I, who was the head of the college at the time, really saw something in me. Uh, and uh, she said, yes, I want him to come. And uh, it was, well, it made my life, really. I'd love us to move on to the next pivotal moment in your design career, because the Yardley, the people at Yardley, the Yardley Awards saw something in you, to use your words. So you won the Yardley Awards, and that really sort of propelled you into another sphere. Tell us about that. And the images that we see on the screen are taken around that time. When was that? Was that 68? No, 67. And there were many of us there. I think uh, this article, which is hardly legible, every Bill Gibb was there. Vanessa Clark was there. Janice Wainwright was there. I mean, it was just an amazing amount of people who were involved in this thing. And we had been staying at the um, hotel together at where it was held. And it was just, but you know, I can hardly remember half of this stuff, you know, because it was that busy and that detailed and that I won was just for me a, a miracle. Once again, you need a lot of miracles to get through the world. <laughs> right. But what I love about um, the image in the um, newspaper article, is just that lovely kind of wearable glamour that you achieve through your designs. And it just says the sixes, you know, it's a short trend, the cot trench, the collar up, the shades, it's so stylish. Yes, it was. Uh, yeah, that was the great thing about it. I think that one of the things we did know about the sixties was that everything that had gone before had changed everything. And that uh, the way people honored uh, designers, young people. Uh, the way, and remember, the music was there too. We, the music of the moat and everything, it was all happening at the exact same time. So you were a part of this incredible zeitgeist. And the intoxication of a zeitgeist can be uh, consuming. So, and you don't really realize that because to be a designer, you really have to work all the time. And so the image on the screen I love because it's it with you in that military jacket and sitting on the Union Jack box with the the model in the mini, it's its very sort of Sergeant Pepper, isn't it? You yeah. get a real sense of London in that era. That was it, yes, I totally, it was a moment, yes. I think I, I remember you saying that you, you knew Roger Nelson, who had set up his own business with Twiggy modeling. Yes, and I was so envious of it. I thought to myself, I'm going to do that. Well, when you get out of college, nobody wants to hire you. Suddenly you think, oh my God, what am I going to do? So I started my own business. I talked to a few people into some, into backing. one of them was Peter Cook, who was Dudley, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, you know. And anyway, they went along with it. And it was, it was just fabulous. So I was able to do that. And, uh, but running a business is uh, so much harder than anyone imagines, especially if you're a one man band. And if you can't find all those kind of people to connect to who would enhance so uh, I think the business lasted for about three years, three and a half years, and then I closed it down. And uh, in the process, I was offered uh, this birth contract. And, and so the that, images on the screen, just to let everyone know, the images on the screen are from now, are from the um, collections for Worth. So we're back into that Worth moment. And you were saying that you were brought in specifically almost to sort of enliven it and bring it into the 60s moment. So you designed this Mademoiselle for Worth collection that we can see on the screen? Yes, yes. But I had done also earlier two couture collections, which you might have seen in the earlier garments with that kind of Japanese feel about it. So, that, you know, one, we were always 
taught and, and believe that um, we stimulate cultures from other places. And so I, Japan was making a tremendously important effect on Western culture at the time. And I thought that the sari and the obi would be a perfect thing to restructure Western style, basically suits and coats. And so I did that. Mm. And so the images on the screen now are sort of drawing on, are drawn from the Mainworth collection. And you can see some traces of those influences in this work. And I think for me, the work has, particularly these dresses, have a real sensuality about them. And again, this would have been 19, maybe 68, 69, I think. Mm -hmm. And they are, they're timeless and they're, they're quite ahead of their time. Other designers were still doing that slightly kooky look, I think you described it as. But this is so much more grown up. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I didn't quite understand that kooky look. So, you know, I think you do follow your own emotional proclivities, you know, and and that was what I was most interested in. I still elegance and elegant movies. And, you know, when we were at the college, uh, we would go to Paris and we saw, and this is when all these people were alive, Balenciaga, we saw Chanel, we saw Pierre Cardin, we saw um, Courage. I, the list is endless that you get to visit as Givenchy all these people who were just, you know, giants in the business and who, who made the most beautiful clothes. So one is constantly being, you know, affected by that background. And yet you still have to create something which is your own and has it, your own voice in it. Who were some of the designers that you most admired when you were starting your career? On the one hand, you have this, this beautiful, sharp attention to detail tailoring, but then you also have this more sensual, softer, cleaner look. Who were the designers that you most admired? Well, I'd have to say that um, Yves was brilliant. I mean, Yves Saint Laurent was brilliant. Givenchy was uh, even, Givenchy had this sort of modernity that sort of was statuesque almost. And so to some extent, what you're trying to do is both not be them, but try to find a form that has that kind of, excitement and yet uh, elegance. And, you know, you're fighting through a whole bunch of things, things that you, you know, you don't want to look like this or you don't want to look like that. It's one of those things where you keep working at it. You work at it hard. And also, we must never forget that when I was working with Worth, it was a business. I was designing that and I was working for other people too, because like the European designers, we, we could have a major client like worth in this case or like Chanel and then you could have all the you could work for other people maybe not with the same kind of exposure but definitely work for them and I did a lot of that which is so, on, so in fact on the screen across these two images we've got Mademoiselle on the right hand side as you look at it but you've got the main line for worth but you've also got Baccarat, um in this woman's wear daily article and I think in the article itself you speak about working for many different brands. So you were freelancing. Yes, of course. It was a great arrangement, you know, and it still is really because the, the house really, what you're trying to do is to give them the sort of thing that in the case of Worth, I could invent it because there was no previous Worth line. Unlike Chanel, which Carl entered in, there was a previous style that could be enhanced. Whereas in Worth, it was like a beginning. So I started with something that I thought would be interesting, you know, at least uh, that was my, <laughs> my overall intent anyway. And so tell us about cannibal clothing, because were you designing cannibal clothing at the same time as oh, doing Worth and Baccarat? A little later. Cannibal came a little later after Worth. And you wanted, this is, in a way, you're sort of seeing the evolution of designing. You just, the one thing about designing, you're constantly going forward. There is no holding back. There's no looking back and saying, oh, that was such a wonderful time at work. What am I doing? The next thing is the next thing, and you must move on. And, and that's the great thing about fashion. It forces you forward all the time. And so even, so you go out of ready-to-wear, out of couture, and you do ex very expensive ready-to-wear, which is... These things are made with great skill and uh, beautiful fabric. So it was an easy transition in a kind of crazy way because it just means you're kept 
pushing yourself. And it is a kind of journey that you're on and, so, and you can feel it. You know, each customer represents uh, an achievement of that kind. But they're very different ways of working, aren't they? Between Worth, Cannibal Clothing and the other brands in your own line. Because at Worth, were you, am I right in thinking that you were, you headed up a team of designers? Whereas when you were doing your own work, when you were doing Cannibal Clothing, it, it was you doing everything. I remember you telling me about um, welcoming the buyers in your Kingley Street studio with a hole in the ground. Hole in the floor, you mean? <laughs> yes. Uh, that's it. The one-man band thing is a, a really interesting condition because you must put on lots of hats. And, you, and also you do, you know, learn the importance of, of those details, uh, the way the order is structured. And people, you know, it's so, when you're at that end, you can feel all the frustration of actually the manufacturer. Why do you, you didn't order this color, you should have ordered that color, this size, this size. You didn't have this size, you should have had that size. It goes on and on and on. So it's one of the things I think everyone would like to leave and just be on the design side. I just want to do yeah. that. And yeah. so I mean, do that. when you're ever able to do that, that becomes a tremendously wonderful thing to do. I'm just noticing that actually there's a wonderful question in the chat that speaks to what we're saying. What advice would you have for a young fashion designer that might be starting their career? Oh, uh, well, I, one of the great things you do, you have to learn how clothes are made. You must know everything you can about the making of clothes. It's just paramount. Because it's one thing to talk about a bias dress, but it's one thing to cut it and know how you have to sew it to make it work and how, it, and how nothing's easy. It's all hard if you know what I mean. So it's one of those things that I would tell people, just learn your craft, it's so important. The designing is one thing, but the craft is everything. Because also it'll give you great command over the, over the development of any kind of thing you want to do, whether it's coats, suits, dresses, evening dresses, weddings, or whatever the case is, this background will be a foundation for you. And also it'll allow you even greater freedom, though at first it doesn't seem so. That's fantastic advice. And, and the next few slides I love because I think it really reminds us of how present your work was. So these adverts, these magazine cuttings, so Highland the Booker at Harvey Nichols, Clothes for the Clothes at Jugglers, and this is all your work. And it, I think it really is this very wearable glamour or sense, it's got a sensuality, a subtle sensuality about it. So whilst it's aspirational, it's somehow achievable, which I yeah. find really interesting about your work. Uh, Carnival was great because he, he was both Jersey and Suede, so we were able constantly to intermingle these two together and had a wonderful uh, people who could sew these pieces. And it, anyway, it was great fun. And uh, God knows. <laughs> I remember, um, I think it was um, Anna Piaghi, the fashion journalist, that said that... Um, Fashion is professional play, and I think you get that sense. I mean, look at these images from Cosmopolitan. If that's not a snapshot of professional play, I don't know what is. <laughs> but it gives a sense of how present you were, you know, within history as it was happening at that moment. Oh, very, very true. This is, uh, and it, well, it was like a stream. You were on it. It's running. It's it's moving forward, and you're moving with it. I think one of the great things about youth is this in fact they create a chance of, to have a brand new world they can create a brand new world and uh, not know they're creating it if you know what i mean that it's a world that has changed from some previous uh, form one of the things that i learned through um our sort of conversations over these last months is the way that creativity you've mentioned as a designer knowing your craft and that's your foundation but I also get a sense when we've been speaking that your artistic side is part of your foundation as well. And that by artistic side, I mean the constant drawing, the constant art working or painting, you know, the constant study of the female form. So you understand how a fabric would fall on a body, for example. You understand how a body moves because you're sketching the whole time. I wonder if you could say something about it. We've had a lovely question come through asking whether the paintings in the back are your artworks, which of course they are, but would you like to say something about the way that your artistic side is woven into your entire career? 
I don't know whether you could even separate the two of them. But one of the things that I can say is that when I was trying to learn this craft, I concentrated on that. But before that, I had also been, when I was at uh, in high school, I was doing life classes, which meant that the female form and the male form were all being, we have to draw them constantly. And you'd have to draw them sometimes very quickly, like you get two minutes for this and you'd have to sketch it. So it gives you this fluidity that you have to respond to. So by the time I actually get into fashion, which is a thing together, I'm still haunted by the history of art, the history of painting and drawing. But because of the nature of how many people you're working for, you don't get to do much. So it's one of those things where you you have to, that urge to draw or paint or something has to be slightly put to the side. It's almost like a hobby because of this other thing that's going on. But you believe in it, I think. And I, and, uh, and that belief and that, and that urge, I think, becomes the foundation to go forward. Absolutely. I definitely recognize that. So certainly within my own career, I think even now that I've moved out of fashion and I'm in the museum, I have to draw. It is like an impulse, isn't it? So I, I really understand this idea that you're, you've constantly drawn, you've constantly painted. Um, we're going to come on to talk about your paintings towards the end of our conversation. So thank you for that question. So let's move on. So you've had this wonderful, make a big splash in London. There's the excitement in the press. You're at the helm of work. But then you move back to the States. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, that, uh, yeah, this was, I think, my last collection in England. But you can see that I was still interested in very simple solutions to the modern dress. And I still believe that that's the key in spite of what anyone would say, meaning there's no real theatricality here. There's just presence and a kind of elegance that I totally believed in and, and tried to uh, follow that clue. But anyway, moving back to America was the most extraordinary thing. I, I, having done it, I realized when I got there that I was not an American. I thought I was an American all the time I was in England. I felt like an American. <laughs> I didn't feel like an ang- I felt like an English person. Suddenly I didn't know I couldn't read the newspapers. I kept trying to devise ways to understand the culture. And also I tried to get jobs in very, you know, Halston. I went to Halston. I went to Bill Blass. I, you know, I went to a lot of places with my portfolio. I'm thinking that because I had done all these wonderful things that it would immediately be attractive. But it was a culture that I didn't truly understand. But I got a job as a, in a young men's business, uh, ESI, Dan Stone Industries. And they were really great. And uh, we did a lot of wonderful stuff together for about six years. So I was really good there. I had a good time. So you worked on menswear. And then I think, I mean, I love these I was, pieces that you did for Adolfo. I was a freelancer. So I worked at Adolfo as well, doing the furs at the same time. The furs always kept me in the couture business, which is one of the reasons why I loved working in fur, even though I wasn't doing expensive women's clothes at the time. But, you know, one of the things is it's always available to you. One of, that's the whole thing about this. One of the things that I can say to young designers is all opportunities are of make it possible to do different sort of things. And I worked for a guy called Searle. This was a piece. He made raincoats, but he wanted to do ladies' more formal wear, you know, suits and jackets and things. So I made this collection for him, and I had a lot of fun doing that. One of the things about fashion is once you do it, it's so much fun. It's it's, It's quite addictive, right? Yeah, it is. You can't wait to do the next one and the next one and the next one. Absolutely. And so I I want to sort of um, move on to your couture collection. So... We have you inspired by women yet again, but this time it's your wife, really, that uh, inspires you and encourages you to set up Highland Book of Couture. Right. So tell us about your wife's influence and how well, you began this business that we now see on the screen. Well, I went to Florida and was involved in a business that uh, didn't work out, and I had an opportunity. We decided, Charlotte, my wife, decided that I should start my own business because I hadn't done, obviously, these kind of clothes for quite a few years now. But I had been wanting to do them. And I, you know, I kept up with everything that was going on. 
And she was so important to the idea that we should do it, that we set this company up. And I think there's a picture of her and I, is there? Okay. Yes, I think coming up, there we are, there's Charlotte. Right. And so, uh, you know, when you have a partner who really wants very much for you to fulfill your desires, it becomes a, a much easier thing to do and to, to imagine. And as I said, uh, it also, I had to go back to those days of being a one-man band. Well, not quite a one-man band, but mostly a one-man band in so much that I had to not only design it, I had to cut it, to, to get it, to, to cut it, to make it work. To, to It's just a tremendous amount of work just making one garment. So when you imagine making 50 garments of this kind of caliber, it's another thing altogether. But we did it. And we had this amazing show in, in Miami in Coconut Grove, which was just magical. Uh, you can see it. And we have a Ray staged, had these beautiful models and the clothes look pretty good too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love the fact that around Highland Book of Couture, I remember you saying that your, your principles, if you like, or the things that inspired you were this idea of grace, romance, distinction. So for you, how does grace, romance, and distinction come through in some of the garments that you created, inspired by Charlotte, and with her encouragement? Well, I'd like to believe that uh, it's an intrinsic part of that whole relationship. When you have a beautiful person with you, is you can make beautiful things, as simple as that, really. <laughs> and also, you know, you're also pushed by the fact that you're trying to, I was, it's so interesting that, this collection would have been 30 years since the Worth collections. So by this time, you know, if you haven't learned how to make clothes, you, you should forget about it altogether. And so I was able to do most of anything I wanted. And I was particularly interested in evening wear at the time because it was that there was this sort of feeling in, at the moment that the 1850s was really interesting. And so I wanted to kind of have that effect in some cases so and that kind of grandeur uh, that feeling that uh, things are even more beautiful than you think they are so that's the kind of clothes i was trying to make at the time but uh, you know it's it's just you do it and there it is and so who were you dressing who were the women that you were dressing i mostly people who at this moment i i can't really mention i actually did dress uh, the first miss trump incidentally i don't think i ever told you that <laughs> No. And as a dress of hers, I, I don't have a, I have a picture of it somewhere, but uh, it was really nice. And it, it was an easy fitting and she was rather pleasant. And uh, I got through that. So I feel that's a, an achievement. But a woman who bought over five of these gowns in different colors and everything, it was just absolutely amazingly successful in its initial response. And I also love this picture um, of one of the, the coats or the it's a dress with a coat, I think, but the garment in movement and it has a really beautiful regal feeling about it. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite pictures, too. I, I, and also it was sort of like, you know, if you get to do this sort of thing on this scale, thanks to my beautiful wife, and then uh, yeah, that's the deal. That's the prize. I don't know what more you would want, really. But that life pushes you on, as you know. And we did that for quite a while. And and then we left Miami. And we because Charlotte's family was all in California and my family was in England, we chose to go to California. And uh, we set the business up there. And we had this remarkable moment that, that we had been in InStyle magazine as a result of Richard Schiff, my son-in-law, who was had a new house and they had a they had a sort of ballroom place where they could dance and they were doing this dance. The idea was that I would dress all the movie stars who came and there were lots of them and I dressed them all and we had this wonderful thing. So this came out in August of that year, which is, and then uh, we had a big show. We had a big opening that was going to take place on the 13th of September. But of course, 9-11 happened so that show was that was that was a come down so that changed everything 9 11 changed everything and even though we struggled on for a few more years doing lots of different versions of it and 
uh, losing that moment where you, you're in the magazine and you're getting ready to have a really fantastic opening and you have these beautiful women to, to do, and then that happened and it took, I think, took the steam out of America itself. So mm -hmm. it has to die, become a normal country without this uh, sort of incredible tragedy hanging over us. And then, you know, you sort of keep doing it until you, and you know, the, the thing has a way of petering it out anyway everything does and so that i just accepted it as a way of life you know and so so Harlan, i've got another great question that's come through and um, this is from someone who's an educator very keen to add african-american and black designers into i think it's a she her curriculum and she's saying she'll definitely be adding you which is wonderful but she'd also like to know which one aspect as a designer would you most like to be remembered for oh i don't know that's uh you know i i think that uh, the reason why worth is so important is that somebody had to follow and somebody had to do it and i think everything that's happened since has never been as interesting as what happened in 1969 when i became the head designer uh, the way they still exist uh and they're doing you know really kind of crazy opulent things that uh but the central concept of elegance and fashion and and the way it actually functioned is not there and that's a sadness but that's just the way it was you know that's how it goes i would say that uh, the only reason i mentioned that is because the other things uh, i highland book of couture was really great but it was regional i mean i i was in south florida it was a place where people did a lot of you know playing around and having a good time so it was a good place to have done the business whereas california was a little bit more difficult a lot of movie stars but by the time i started really getting over the 9 11 thing the big fashion companies like all the french companies were coming in and they were giving these garments away meaning people could just whereas i was selling them and, and they were giving away and that made a, it really kind of like a, a discouraging part of of that uh, event and during the time so yeah you can't compete with expensive garments that's that's impossible but coming back to worth um, there was, um if, if that's a particular moment that you'd love to be remembered for i was really it really intrigued me when you said that there's a wonderful parallel between what you did when you were heading up worth and what worth did when he began the whole couture system really do you want yeah. to say something about that well, yes, I, I think that uh, this is a, what I call a little bit of kismic. This is a, so he's an Englishman, right? And he's in his early 20s, he goes to Paris. And, and then he's, it's been about 10 years later before the House of Worth gets going. But uh, he was a foreigner. And so there I was, an American in London. So our, our lives have this kind of way, it's almost as if worth itself is made of these moments where the foreigner makes the country, makes the company, or makes the design. And I think that the fact that he was an Englishman in Paris and I was an American in London gave a kind of uh, symmetry to the house of worth that it didn't have naturally. And anyway, I just felt like that was something interesting anyway. <laughs> I don't know how. So it's a wonderful, wonderful kind of echoing. But one of the, the other things, um, and here's some more of the press around your couture collections. But looking at your garments, I'm always struck by the, it's quite deceptive because they look really simple, but I, I know that it's the simple. I, I think we've frozen. I think, yes, it is the simple things that uh, make it work. And it's also something I was extremely into. It's itself in your paintings. Oh, yes. There's a wonderful reduction in some of your paintings. So I love this painting of Lizzo. Tell us about Lizzo and how you came to paint this particular portrait of her and well, how it relates to your engagement with women. Because here we go again, it's sort of women and elegance and your conversation with those things once again. I saw this Vogue cover of uh, Lizzo that was really beautiful, but it was all kind of fluffy chiffon. And on the inside, she had this wonderful beige uh, fitted dress that I liked because it showed all of her body form and it still was super elegant and still super sexy and, and it was just great. So I decided 
I have to paint that. I have to find that because it was leaving that perfect form that everyone so interested in the hour shape and then getting to something that is quite sensuous and different and also a beautiful woman at the same time. So what can I say? It was very enticing and, and wonderful to do. And just to work on these things, because I was always touched by seeing Sargent's paintings and Sargent did these beautiful, absolutely elaborate gowns with but the women, the gowns went on and there's a head in, in, in the gown, which was kind of amazing. I didn't quite have to do that, but uh, I felt very close to him when I was trying to do this fabric to make it look both sensual and also body forming as well. So it, he's always been a great inspiration when it comes down to the elegant woman, if you know what I mean. Wonderful. And, the, and that sort of sensuality that we see in your fashion design it's right here in this particular painting yes yes and and I, I there's one advantage i must talk about painting from fashion one of the things about fashion is that fashion because you you read the woman in the dress or the coat or the suit or whatever it is in which thankful my wife is has some of these things but painting it is a kind of wonderful kind of permanence you know you get to hang with it you can sit around and look at it so it has a kind of treat that the fashion doesn't have. We're coming now, I think we have maybe 10 minutes left. So I'm just going to see if there are any other questions in the chat. Some of them I've managed to, in the Q&A, sorry. Some of them I've managed to weave into our conversation. So we've just spoken about paintings. Um, one question has come through around Winsmore and the work that you've done for Winsmore. Someone found a vintage jacket that was designed by you for Winsmore. So maybe something about no, I love Winsmore it. days and also something about the way that young people are rediscovering your work through buying it vintage, you know, buying it now, finding it now on eBay or in a thrift shop or in a vintage store. What would your response be to that? I thought that I had a good time at Winsmore. It was one of my big clients at the end of my time in England. And uh, we had some exciting things to do. I got to look pretty close to the actual factory itself. So it was a very convenient place to be. And they were very lovely people. And I was able to do pretty much what I was doing with people like uh, Baccarat and other things. But I created a, a different image for them. And I wanted to create this. One of the things of being in California, I think we've forgotten how this actually functions. There's a place where winter comes and it comes and it lasts a long time. So you get to do a lot of clothes, coats. Coats are really important, at least they were at the time, and suits. And Winsmore did beautiful, beautiful coats and things. And so I was able to integrate my stuff into there. And I think we, we were always pleased with each other. Um, I left on a high note there. So it was one of my favorite times, so only because of not only the freedom, but I love doing the coats. I love that specific kind of way in which you could design around a customer's needs. And it, it takes all the kind of um, fuzziness out of what you're doing, meaning you know exactly what they want in the sense of the overall sense. And then all you have to do is make something beautiful. Um, time for one more question. And there's a question around models and how you went about selecting your models. And Particularly, what are your thoughts on the growing visibility of diverse models, particularly black female models today? I think it's fabulous. I, I in all my collections, especially in, in all the collections, actually, even at Worth, I had black models and uh, also I had them at Highland Booker Couture. I had two or three favorites that uh, I would always, I'd have two models that I particularly made the clothes on and every after that everyone would have to fit those clothes and uh, one was a black model that i was very fond of and uh, another one was this wonderful caucasian girl and she to this day i still see her and it's just one of those things i think models are so important to the whole thing and i think one of the things that i think giving up fashion at the end was somehow losing that relationship having those specific people to help you push forward because fashion is a thing about pushing forward and having some example of it the physical person there can be of an extraordinary uh, you know gives you sort of energy that you wouldn't naturally have 
I, I love what's happening with uh, the black models today. I think, uh, I just hope it's not something that, you know, how things can be faddish. I hate fads. I think it, it should be just a permanent condition of, of the craft and of the work. Absolutely. I think there's, there's a, a real joy in picking up magazines like the UK Vogue under, under um, Edward Ennenfall and you flick through and it's, it's still a wonderful surprise to see black models on you know virtually every other page and you know when, when you were coming up when i was coming up that would have been unthinkable so yes there's some ways to go but it there is a particular relief and joy almost when you you find that you open a magazine and there's that beautiful surprise there yeah and also um, it takes away it it sort of evens the society out a bit you know you could see everything because that's what you live in you live with everyone as you go into the streets or stores or what have you all shades of people and and that it's actually being presented to you in the magazine is the signification that it has arrived as a not only visual clue but a visual norm absolutely and we're almost out of time, but it's been wonderful talking around these common themes between your design work and your paintings, the themes of beauty, glamour, grace, romance and distinction. And I, I can just see there's a particular ebb and flow around those themes across your whole career, your whole artistic career. So it's a pleasure speaking to you about that. And I, I wonder if we might end with, I hope that you might share the Betty Saar quote with us that I found particularly inspiring that in some ways for me sums up what you've been able to achieve through your design work, through your painting, and also I think through what you've shared with us today about your entire artistic career. Well, I, it's so interesting. I discovered this uh, quote from Betty Saar, and you have to remember, I made that wish on Woodward Avenue at some age of 19, or, and you're never given a wish without also being given the power to make it come true. Now that is just amazing. So everyone should think about that. You're never given a wish without the power of making it come true. And so I was given this, I wished, and I had the power to make it come true and it came true. <laughs> and you can do this physically. You can learn these things, at least I did. And I'm always hopeful that everyone does. There's so much beautiful art going on today. Wonderful, wonderful things are happening. And if we can just keep this terrible, ugliness of the wars and the, and the friction and some keep it at bay somehow in order to live a better life and a beautiful one. I think that's surely the aim. Thank you so much, Hein, and that's a beautiful moment to end on. I've really appreciated getting to know you during this time and it's been wonderful to share one of our conversations with the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.